Okay guys, so a very good morning. Welcome to the briefing for the 17th of October. I hope you all had a fantastic weekend. A uh, quick run through then of the state of play, some of the weekend news and then what to look out for uh, this week because there are a few major events upcoming. Uh, starting off though with how things were in Asia and overall it was uh, fairly quiet, not really too much uh, to speak of and it hasn't really been uh, the things we're going to discuss in the briefing today are more forward-looking for big macro events. Uh, in terms of actual major headline news over the weekend, there wasn't really too much to speak of. Uh, just the usual lots of Brexit talk, uh, new forecasts for the pound, which we'll talk about uh, later from various investment banks, uh, some news about Deutsche looking to just reduce exposure in the US and other uh, European sectors as well, so kind of regular news flow I'd say, nothing really uh, outstanding on that regard. Starting off though, uh, let's have a look at the US T-note, that's what you can see here in uh, the bottom right hand corner of my charts and really we're identifying the period of 6.30, so really from here to here, that kind of hour period that we had on Friday. Uh, and that was when Janet Yellen spoke, so it was after we had already left and European markets had closed. Uh, but it did see a, a fairly decent move. I mean, it wasn't anything uh, out of this world, uh, but certainly US yields saw uh, some upside to close out the week. So uh, the key theme seemed to have been her wondering whether there was room to let the US economy run hot and whether such a high-pressure economy could enhance things like labor force participation. Uh, while this could be potentially dovish for the front end, the perception was that it could allow inflation to be allowed to run higher, which helped the long end sell off and steepened the curve. So increasing US yields in the long end, pressuring then longer duration bonds, and what we're seeing here in the 10-year moving lower. This is kind of a, seems to be an emerging pattern with some of the central bank speak at the moment. Because remember, we had Mark Carney last week talk about um, suggesting the bank would tolerate a bit of overshoot in inflation over the course of the next few years. Uh, that also likewise saw a similar type reaction in the gilt market, where UK yield surged after he said that. As such, gilts then uh, printed fresh lows at the time. So, buns this morning, uh, potentially a little bit of catch up with that. I mean, the comments did come late on Friday, uh, and technically we went through that S1 already at 63.06. Uh, we kind of got within a few ticks, three ticks of that S2 before bouncing, settling back to S3, or excuse me, 163 um, in the Bund at the moment. Uh, looking at the DAX, a bit of a gap lower. Uh, really not too much to speak of with that gap lower, so it's not really a great surprise to see a, a closing of the gap here uh, in the DAX already, and likelihood that'll keep the Bund under a bit of pressure around these more depressed levels uh, to start trade this morning. So uh, DAX then just coming back towards positive territory. Uh, with that, just though looking at the yelling comments, one thing obviously that's been uh, a, a quite a prevalent trend of late has been this one of the US dollar. Uh, the dollar this morning is pretty flat but did rise on Friday session. Uh, it's given back slightly overnight in Asia but we're just creeping higher again now as Europe comes in. Uh, so we'll be keeping eye on the euro dollar pair. Uh, but the dollar has benefited from strong US data. Uh, if you were to track the white line that's the economic surprise index so this is basically a measurement of US data and in terms of the median consensus where does the actual uh, number come out and that is generally an upside surprise has been the case. We've had surprisingly strong data in the states ever really since they decided to hold interest rates in a September meeting. That then consequently the Bloomberg dollar spot index, the blue line continues to move higher. In fact we're now at seven month highs. This of course then leads us into the fact that December was still around 64% when going off the CME's Fedwatch um, tracker, uh, the Bloomberg measurement probably a touch higher, around 68%. So still very much baked in that December 
uh, rate rise expectation. That none too altered by the really the Yellen comments. Um, one thing though to to really look at is the week in its entirety uh, to get a better feel for. As I said, things are pretty quiet at the moment, but certainly there could be some periods of volatility throughout the trading week. Uh, looking at Monday, and first of all, just a quick look at the earning side of things. You've got Bank of America today, Goldman Sachs Tuesday, and then Wednesday you've got Morgan Stanley. So following suit with some of the better than expected uh, bank results that we had last week, kicking off with JP Morgan City and Wells Fargo, um, all surprisingly strong on the fixed income trading uh, side of things, which has been a particular weak spot of recent quarters. Uh, so that's bounced back and we'd be expecting similarly strong results out of these other names coming out in the first half of this week. As such, I wouldn't be really looking for much market movement on the back of those results because the market has now factored that in, given those uh, kind of first bellwether names that reported a few days ago. Uh, overall, there's 90, 90 US companies reporting, so we do tend to pick up a bit of pace now. Uh, and there's 40, 40 coming out of Europe. Uh, the other highlights here I've got identified is Intel, uh, Yahoo, Johnson & Johnson, eBay, Amex. There are a couple of the other names of a larger market cap uh, or sector significance to look out for, such as Netflix, which will be aftermarket today. Um, moving on, though. From an inflation perspective, Tuesday is pretty interesting uh, because you get the UK CPI reading and the US CPI reading. Now, just given the commentary that we've heard from Yellen and Mark Carney last week, it will be certainly interesting to see, uh, and even more so for the UK, about any feed through, obviously, from this continued depreciation of the pound. Uh, you've already heard of lots of retailers actually taking advantage of the increased demand from foreigners coming in, let's say to London for example, um, some of the high-end luxury names have actually increased prices by pretty substantial margins uh, because people are taking advantage of that cheap currency. And as such then, uh, there is going to be a slightly lagged effect, but at some point or other, probably in towards year end in 2017, we will start to see prices surge from an inflation uh, metrics. Likewise, from the US, it'd be, it'd be interesting to keep an eye on that. But then one of the bigger things for the week, firstly, starting off with Europe, will be the ECB interest rate decision and press conference. That, of course, comes on Thursday. Let's just take a look at the current state of play here, because from a timing point of view, really, this week's decision from the ECB is not that big a deal. Um, much like the Fed, it's going to be more December as a timeline uh, for when the ECB are going to really potentially make some more interesting changes towards their QE program. Uh, you can see that here from the latest Bloomberg survey of 50 economists. This was conducted last week. Um, additional ECB stimulus is the orange. The QE parameter changes is the blue. You can see from October there's a very minimal chance that most foresee any real changes in the ECB. Certainly December is what's being priced in. Additional ECB stimulus, actually, you're looking at 90% of those surveyed are expecting some sort of uh, change here. That change, obviously, being that the current QE program ends in March 2017, and so they're probably looking out for extensions of that. Uh, and then, likewise, any extension of timeline will probably require a QE parameter change of sorts. So certainly December is the key month in terms of timing from the ECB. Now, economists bring forward their projections when the ECB will start winding down purchases. So is it time to taper yet? Well, it's being brought forward by obviously those Bloomberg source comments two or three weeks ago, but certainly not uh, any time soon. Uh, if you were to look at the October survey, the most latest, you're kind of looking the market at the moment is peaking around Q4 of 2017, which kind of sounds accurate given the extension that could be looming in March. Next chart then, the various ways in which um, most economists say that stimulus will be delivered by the ECB. 
and the most logical step and the one that's priced in nearly to 100% is extension of QE past the current deadline. Other things are more long-term loans. Expanding monthly QE purchases is much smaller. Remember, things like expanding QE purchases, the whole problem is by purchasing 80 billion uh, amount at that rate at this present point means that they're quickly draining the eligible bonds that they can buy if they continue a pace in the current guise of the program. So expanding monthly purchases is probably the reason why it's so low a probability is because it's going to require even more changes towards the, the actual parameters of the purchases. Deposit rate cut, certainly that has fallen an expectation from the last previous survey and the other measures are also minimal. So really it's the extension uh, continuity that looks most likely from the ECB. Uh, the way that which they could change then in terms of the subtle tweaks We've seen this chart before, but it still rings true in terms of really uh, the order of difficulty and implementation. Abandoning the capital key could be the most powerful, but the most complex in terms of politically pushing it through. That's why uh, as a, an actual uh, possibility, it only tracks around 25% where increasing the issuer issuer limits is the most uh, probable action that they'll take in addition to the extension of timeline. This one made me laugh though. Look how tired this guy looks. My God, he looks about 105 years old. He is, yeah, what, what? poor guy. But tougher times are to come for Mr. Draghi because he's got some real decision-making to make uh, come December. But uh, as you can see here, that is actually Draghi at his most happiest, uh, believe it or not. Anyhow, moving on, the other big thing, of course, uh, just quickly actually going back to the calendar, you'll see here on Wednesday, you've got the third presidential debate. Now, this is the third and final round 3.0, if you like, of Trump v. Clinton. And Clinton ran away with it in round one. She also did, but to a lesser degree in round two. So... You know, it's, uh, it's the last chance saloon for Donald to really uh, up his game. But if we were to look at this chart, this was something that I saw compiled by Danska over the weekend. Uh, and it just, you know, we've been talking about that um, electoral college vote layout of the US political system geographically. And really there's a couple of key states that you need to be monitoring. And these being the, the so-called swing states. Now, I saw this. It's quite an easy way to look at it. And this is Florida. Uh, you can see is probably, the, or it is, the largest in terms of actual votes. So default, one of the key battlegrounds. And Clinton is comfortably uh, in the lead there. Ohio, of course, is historically very important. Uh, Trump leading Ohio is now gone. And you can see Clinton is now ahead. Pennsylvania is a complete no-brainer for Clinton, as far as the polls are concerned, as is Virginia. Now, Wisconsin is Clinton, uh, Colorado, and North Carolina, the other big swing state. The only one Trump is still ahead is Georgia. So looking at all of these, uh, it's getting increasingly more difficult if polls are to be believed in order for Trump to, to really look like uh, he could come back. Looking at the bookies odds, this is the betting odds. Now, obviously, take with a pinch of salt. You'll remember that the bookies had it completely wrong in terms of Brexit. But with the polls heavily now in Clinton's favour, the bookies have got 85% to 15% for Clinton at this point in time. So certainly you can see the calamity that is Donald Trump over the previous few weekends with the sexual assault cases and derogatory comments and so on have seen this balloon out to the, the widest gap really it has been, if you look in terms of odds, it's ever been in the whole presidential race. One thing though, never be complacent when it comes to the vote of, let's say, middle America uh, much like Middle England, uh, I would not be discounting uh, completely 
Trump at this point, but certainly this is the most clear as it's been uh, for Clinton thus far, and you've got to be watching out for that um, presidential debate that's on Wednesday. Going back then to the week, the other big thing, so as I've discussed, you've got US earnings, you've got the ECB interest rate decision and press conference, you've got the presidential debate, and the other big thing this week is Chinese GDP. Now, last week, if you remember, midweek, we had a, a really risk-off morning. I think it was Thursday morning. And that was because Chinese trade balance was a surprisingly, uh, surprisingly weak. I think the size of the surplus was the smallest since around the beginning of the year. In addition to exports being down roughly 10%, was much worse than expected. So GDP is really critical, uh, particularly given some of the subtle devaluation of their currency we've seen with uh, very multi-year low fixes for the remnant B. And this was all some of the things that kick-started the volatility at the beginning of 2016 and could provide, if it got worse and draw more attention, or if it drew more attention, um, the ability for the Fed to hike rates in December. So the GDP number will be particularly interesting. Looking at Chinese GDP, it's been fairly constant. I mean, we had probably the pace of uh, decrease in this bar chart was more prevalent 2013-14 and actually we've started to level at 6.7. Most expectation is that it will remain at around those levels but obviously any downside surprises could provide further kind of global headaches for central banks particularly the Fed who are looking to err more on the hawkish side at this present point in time. Okay moving on the other big thing then is obviously the pound Let's just take a look at sterling this morning. Uh, I've marked up here a couple of things. Just reading a couple of the bank notes from the weekend. I think the, the speed in which we declined after that original break of the 2806 Brexit low uh, has caught quite a few forecasters by surprise. And although we've kind of consolidated, obviously that was the algo spike lower that we had there it was just above 120. Uh, we're sitting at 2184 this morning but you can see though it's looking like it's getting to a point where uh, we might see a breakout in price movement in one way or the other. Uh, Credit Suisse they had a latest note they've revised down their year-end target at 116. They did say, though, if we were to get a soft Brexit on favourable terms, then it wouldn't be out of the question to see cable rally back up to 135. Uh, that's in a much longer run, though. Um, but with Credit Suisse, 116 they're looking at. Obviously, you remember we had Goldman Sachs on Friday. They're looking at 114. So this certainly seems to be around the new norm. Uh, this is Credit Suisse's one-year horizon on a hard Brexit so on the, this is the most the kind of range that we're talking about. So relief on a soft Brexit could see 135 recovery in a one one year period. Worst case hard Brexit could see 105. So that's the kind of um, the price levels in which we're looking at. In terms of uh, where we currently stand, obviously that's the algo low was 2034. Uh, we've pretty found a bit of support this morning around S1. Uh, you know, we're looking at that 13th low below here at 44, and then you've got that low print from the 11th at the 21 handle is probably the downside sort of ranges that we're looking at, uh, followed by that algo low. But sterling-wise, if you're looking for a catalyst for potential uh, movement, then you're probably going to have to wait until tomorrow for the UK inflation data to hit. Otherwise, it's going to be more dollar-led in terms of today. Actually, since I've been speaking, the dollar has continued to creep up, hence that euro dollar coming back down to the 110 handle. So just keep an eye on that overnight low at uh, 1.0992 on the downside. Quick look elsewhere in oil, the commodity markets, obviously things OPEC, non-OPEC have, have gone pretty quiet really of late. 
uh, it's all about now whether that deal can really be enacted. So this week, I would certainly still be on guard for potential headline risk. What I mean by that is the comment I'm fully expecting is that there's new disagreement between Iran and Saudi or Russia say that actually we're not willing to do this unless other conditions are met along those kind of lines. And the way that oil has been on the ascent, if I put it on a daily continuation, really this last move from 45 soaring up to 41 and a half and really consolidating around 50 more recently is that we're, it feels like there's room lower rather than higher. I think the upside from here might be limited Whereas on the downside, given the fact that we still have an overall global surplus of supplies in addition to high risk that the deal struck in Algiers may fall apart, I would just be mindful uh, of watching oil on potential downside. But again, you'd probably, I would say, we're locked in a 49 to 52 range unless we hear something substantial break in regards to source comments or someone from either Russia or Saudi making something um, different from the current state of play. Okay guys, uh, gonna wrap it up there. So any questions, please do let us know. Uh, the calendar of the week that I've spoken about, Vast did send that out this morning with the research. Uh, so overall, looking at the daily calendar, uh, just a quick scan pretty quiet this morning but in the afternoon we do have the New York State Manufacturing Index and you got industrial production uh, again though given the timing of deck being in focus I wouldn't be expecting great deal of movement on the back of that uh, you do have the Eurozone CPI coming out but you can see here these are final September readings so again that negates really the possibility of impact so it could be quite quiet. So identify technically your ranges uh, and then just remain vigilant for any unscheduled news that may come out uh, on the squawk box. Okay, guys, enjoy your day and have a good week. Thank you.